Hello, welcome to Here Comes the Bride, The Church Begins. I am Pastor Jim DeVore, the pastor of Cornerstone Church of Little Rock in California. So glad to have you with us. We are in Acts chapter 18. We are taking a look at the book of Acts, uh, kind of a brief devotional walk through the book of Acts every day. And we are currently in Acts chapter 18. We're going to begin with verse 1. So let's go ahead and read through that. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Now, Corinth is just south of Athens, so if you remember the previous devotional on the map there, you can see that Athens is, um, that Corinth is south of Athens. So, um, and he found a Jew named Aquila, verse 2, and a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, so they probably came from Rome, because later on in the book of Romans, Paul is greeting them, and so um, we have a connection that, that they are from Rome. Um, his wife Priscilla, because Claudius has commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Well, there's another reason. <laughs> Should have just read a little farther there. And he went to see them. Because he was on the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So basically we just have Paul coming into Corinth. He meets Priscilla and Aquila. He, they're all tent makers, so they do trade together. And, um, and then also uh, he goes into, the sab and goes into the synagogue, and every Sabbath he reasons with the Jews, tries to persuade both the Jews and the Greeks who are in the synagogue uh, to come to Christ. Okay, that's his normal mode when he arrives in a town. That's going to change, by the way, here in Athens, but let's get the setup of the story. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, remember they were up in, they had stayed back in Berea, then Paul had called for them, so they've caught up to him now and when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So once again, the Jews began to revile him and hassle him. And, and, um, and so Paul just said, Okay, I, I'm done uh, trying to reach the Jew first. He still has a great love for the Jews. That doesn't change. He's just going to go directly to the Gentiles. He said, you know, your blood be on your own hands, on your own heads, meaning um, your charges against me are false. What you're doing is false. And so the problems you're causing are going to be the problems you're bringing upon yourself. Okay, he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So despite the opposition he's getting from the Jews, the synagogue leader, the Jewish synagogue leader, Crispus, has come to Christ with his household. Next door to the synagogue is a, is a Gentile man and um, justice, and he has come to the Lord as well. And so even though Paul has feared for his life because of the, the frustration and the rising up from the Jews, the Lord speaks to him directly and says, Do not be afraid. I'm going to take care of you. And so Paul is able to settle down. And he stays a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now watch verse 12 here. But when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. So Achaia is the regional area. So you all these places that are upset with Paul, you've got Thessalonica and Berea and all of those, um, Athens, Corinth, those where the Jews rose up, they came together as a group and um, tried to get some some large regional pressure now against Paul. So when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crimes, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names of your own law, See to it yourself. I refuse to be a judge of those things. And he drove them from the tribunal. They all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. Gallio paid no attention to any of this. So what happens is, is 
is the ruler says, hey, I've, I've got nothing to do with this. This is a religious manner. It's not a civil manner. I'm not going to deal with it, okay? But then when he kicks them all out of the court, the Jews are all frustrated, so they grab Sosthenes, apparently the new ruler of the synagogue, who apparently also is a Christ follower, and they beat him up right, right, in, in, right in front of the ruling area. So Galileo knows about it, but he does nothing about it. It's his way of saying, hey, it's a religious matter. I'm not going to get involved. But hey, if you end up beating somebody up in the process, I'm not going to stop you. So just, just corrupt, corrupt leadership at that point. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of his brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. So he's, now he's taking Priscilla and Aquila from Corinth, and he's going to head um, east. He's heading home now at the end of the second missionary journey, okay? Um, at Sancria, he cut his hair, for he was under a vow. Now, we don't get a lot of details about the vow here, um, but we're assuming it's a Nazarene vow, which means he decides to cut his hair, and he's not going to um, uh, cut it again until he fulfills his vow. Uh, it appears that the vow may have been in, re in returning to Jerusalem, returning the, uh, the offering that he collected to Jerusalem, um, as well as re returning himself to Jerusalem. And they came at Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a long period, he declared, he declined, but on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills, and he set sail for Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. Now remember, this is an Antioch um, that is near Ephesus, not the Antioch where he came from. After spending time there, he departed and went from one place to the next to the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So he's returning back home on a similar path, and he's going along by the churches as they had been started in the first missionary journey and encouraged in the second missionary journey now that he's at the end of the journey because he's you know, a year and a half in Corinth so he's we're looking at two or three years as he's coming back by on this second journey he's encouraging the churches as he goes okay now a Jew named Apollos a native of Alexandria came to Ephesus he was an eloquent man competent in the scriptures he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning the Jesus though he knew only the baptism of John. Okay, so now we're being introduced to Apollos. This chapter, chapter 18, introduces to a lot of people who we read about later on in the letters. A lot of these people become leaders of churches in the various towns where Paul's going. So uh, as Paul works with them, as they're converted, as they understand properly, as they grow in Christ, Paul begins to take them with him and drop them off at various places, various places so they can strengthen the churches. Okay? So verse 28, Apollos, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. So now he's, gonna, he's going the opposite direction. He's going back to the Corinthian area, area the Athens area, back to the Achaia area. So Apollos is teaching about Jesus, but only knows of the baptism doesn't know of his death and resurrection. He hears about that from, um, from Aquila and Priscilla. They straighten him out. He comes to full truthful knowledge in, of Christ. He grows as a disciple to the point of really showing signs of leadership and evangelism. He wants to go to Achaia to strengthen the people there. And they say, yeah, you're, you're ready to do that. And they send him off. Okay. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those through grace had, who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So when he returned to the Corinth, to the Athens area, to Thessalonica, Berea area, he was also opposed by the Jews, but, but he, was a, he was able to just continue the, the teaching and the message of Paul and uh, the preaching of the gospel, and the Lord was with him, and he was able to refute the Jews, and, he, and many believers began to gather around him. Wow, there we go, chapter 18 in, in uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> Good job. All righty. So uh, thanks for joining us today for Here Comes the Bride. The church begins. We'll be back again next time as we take now a look at chapter 19. Okay, don't, don't run away yet. Don't hit that stop button. Uh, I just realized I kind of want to pull this together for you and um, give you some concluding thoughts. 
here in chapter 18. Remember, our question is, what do we learn about God's eternal plan? Um, and what do we also see about the church and God's eternal plan and about individuals? And let's do this in reverse, okay? Um, God's eternal plan is not based on one individual, even one well-known, powerful speaking individual. So we see that we're dealing with Paul, and he starts in Corinth, and then he goes across back to Ephesus. But really, the story is about the people he picks up along the way. So God, uh, Paul isn't just relying upon himself. Paul knows that the word of God will be spread through many, many other people. And so Crispus, um, is we're going to hear about him later, uh, Titus Justice. Um, Paul reaches these men, they get saved, okay, and then they become leaders in their own churches, in their own congregations. And so then you've got Priscilla and Aquila, who Paul takes from one town to the next and then leaves them to encourage a church. Uh, Apollos comes on the scene and a Priscilla and Aquila encourage him, straighten him out, and he becomes a leader. What chapter 18 really shows is that the church is not reliant on one individual. God's eternal plan isn't reliant on one individual. That the church and God's eternal plan are going to be accomplished through the work and faithfulness of many, many different people. Which means that your church success is not relying upon your pastor or one really good individual in your church. God is going to use everybody, including you, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a church leader, whether you're not either one of those, God is still using you to impact others, to grow his church, and to continue to highlight and bring about his eternal plan. So let that be an encouragement to you. Okay, you can officially hit the end button now. We'll be back again next time.